Hello, everyone. World famous Settlers Lament back here again. And today we have a pretty special topic. Um, as wow, I always forget to mute one of the tabs. Um, uh, so yes, we, we have a pretty special topic today. So as the audience may or may not be aware, uh, recently, um, I don't know if it's a few months ago now or if it's still in the weeks phases, I, I don't even know. Uh, every, everything just zooms by. It was but the 20th. relatively, uh, how, how long? 20th. Okay. Yeah. January. So, yeah. Okay. Wow. That, that's more recent than I thought. Um, I, I guess every, everything just uh, seems to zoom by now. Um, but yes, yeah, so, 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 so recently, uh, the, uh, the, the great Pat Buchanan retired. Um, after a very long year in politics, both as um, an author, a pundit, and a politician, him, uh, and actually a politician, and he has, um, uh, and, and he's he's finally brought that long career to an end. Uh, so he's he's a very influential and important person on the right. So I, I thought it was just and fitting to have a stream uh, going a bit over his career and his ideas, what the impact they've had, their importance, that type of stuff. Uh, to sort of hash that out. And therefore, I decided to take on a few, uh, well, I, I suppose the official designations is Pat Buchanan appreciator when it comes to Aaron McIntyre and Pat Buchanan expert when it comes to David Carlson. Did you want to show us the uh, stack of Pat books you have? I, I, I wasn't going to um, <laughs> because, but yeah, this is, this is, and this isn't all of them. Obviously, this is just like the physical copies. I have the audio and then the, the digital ones, um, PDFs and stuff. Um, I'm a big fan. He's, you know, he's what got me into uh, to conservatism, true conservatism, American conservatism. And, and you know, uh, it was him and then Mark Stein and going from there. It's actually funny because in preparation for this, I was just kind of looking into things. And the American conservative, the magazine he started, um, they kind of rushed the launch date for it to October 7th, 2002 um, in reaction to the rumblings for war with Iraq. I was born the day after, which is really funny to me um, and, and kind of just goes to show like, I don't know, the, the importance and um, legacy and impact that he's had on, I mean, people of all ages. I know, um, you know, old men in their 70s who admired Pat in the 80s and, and 90s when he was running for office. So I think that, you know, really across generations, his ideas are salient and um, always hit the nail on the head. So I'm really happy to be here. Thanks for thanks for having me. Yeah, no, I'm I'm very happy to have you. I, I don't uh, don't know if there's many other Pat experts I could have had uh, like you. Uh, Aaron, would, would you like to share any of your experience? Yeah, like you said, I'm, I'm more of a Pat Buchanan appreciator. Uh, I was I'm, I'm older than you guys by a good bet a bit. So um, I, I have vague recollections. I, I think probably the first politician I was really aware of running would have been someone like Bob Dole, though. I, re I remember, you know, uh, the original George Bush uh, senior because he and Clinton were showing, you know, in a showdown and my father was in the military at the time at the time. So the only thing I really understood about the presidential election is it might impact kind of my father in some way. Uh, but it's one of those things that later on, you know, as you get older, you hear about Pat Buchanan and the positions he held and you understand that his opposition to Bush senior and, and, and Bob Dole and others was, was very interesting. A lot of people would just kind of call him a relic. They wouldn't really give him the time of day. You had a lot of people dismissing him out of hand, but as you look back into his positions, you see just the incredible, you know, legacy that he had and the predictions he made that just routinely came true from predicting the consequences of involvement in the Middle East to, uh, you know, understanding the hollowing out of middle America and the manufacturing base, the desperate issue of immigration well before anyone else cared about this stuff. He really was the proto Trump in every way. You know, Donald Trump was was kind of a, a, a shadow, a charismatic shadow of Pat Buchanan's uh, platform. And when you look back and you see how right he was about just about everything in culture and how much he was derided for it, you can't do anything really but appreciate the fact that he was willing to go out there and take those positions back when they were deeply unpopular, uh, e even in the GOP of 1992 or 96. Yeah, no, I, I totally agree that there's um, 
there's lots in his um in his uh, the, the, lots of the stuff he talked about the, the the whole sort of culture war framework that um that much of mainstream politics is based around now um may have never existed if not for the positive influence that pat was able to have um you know i, I it, it's difficult to determine why exactly america the uh, the American conservative movement has stayed relatively more conservative than other Western conservative movements. I mean, there, there, there's obviously a lot of factors, um, but um, uh, but I, I, I think he's a major influence here. But that said, uh, there, there's a very important thing to get out of the way before we get more into the details on Pat Buchanan, and that is the issue of the lies, slander, and calumny that have been directed towards me by our very own David Carlson here. My minion, my minion is slandering me. He's lying about me. He, he is saying terrible things about me, and I want to make this absolutely clear that he has been claiming that he is now more famous and therefore more important than me, the world-famous Settler's Lament. Now, number one way we know this is not true. World-famous isn't even in, in his name. It's in my name. It's not in his name. See, right here, Settler's Lament is world-famous. I didn't do that. I didn't do that. Uh, StreamYards did that. So, so, so I, I, I don't, I don't want, you know, I, I don't want, you know, it, it, StreamYards would not allow that to happen if not for my own world famous status. Now, n number, number two, number two reason why we know this is false. He says, well, American Virtue is really big now. It has like fifteen thousand subscribers. It's gaining like 16, a thousand subscribers 16, a day. Subscribers. Yeah, oh yeah, just, just, just keep on blowing up. <laughs> and like, oh, I, I run American Virtue, so that means I'm more famous. Executive no, it, director, it, baby. They all know me. No, no, no. no. <laughs> this, this this is this is completely this is completely a fallacy. This is like, you know, I'm I meet, you know, I've met sometimes like dudes from like the third world that they work on some like YouTube channel farm where they have like a mm. hundred people pumping out videos. Um and they, they, they get like they, they get like minimum wage by American standards, but it's a, it's a lot for them where they live. That's like one of them saying, Oh, settler, you know, because I'm working on this YouTube channel farm. That means actually I'm more famous than you are. No, this is not true. He just he just works. There. Okay, is, is he important? I I agree, he's important. But there's there's like what there, there's been like what two dozen people that have contributed to American virtue. Maybe maybe I might be able be willing to say that you get like one twenty fourth of the <laughs> subscriber count counted views. Not in addition to your own channel, but you know per, perhaps like uh per per, per perhaps. Um, instead of your own channel, if that like one twenty fourth would be larger, and perhaps one day you'll have like a million subscribers on American Virtue, and that one twenty fourth will make you more famous than me. I don't know. I can't say. I'm happy God to willing. admit there are there are people out there who are more famous than me. Aaron yeah. McIntyre is more famous to me. I'm not going to deny it. He has he has many more subscribers. But that, that, this this brings us to reason number three why uh, why David Carlson is not more famous nor more important than me, and that is because. <laughs> If you look very carefully at American Virtue, you'll see his view numbers are actually very poor on the one thing that actually matters, live streams and videos on real <laughs> okay. YouTube content. Yeah. It's just this libtard um, TikTok on YouTube content that's doing well. And that, that's it, okay. You know, I'm embrace the Zoomerism. Look, you can't beat no, him. I'm, join I'm not, him. I'm not join him. That, that's, that, that's not uh, Aaron McIntyre, that's not real. he that's started making now. shorts. He's doing reels now. I've you can't those, prove so. that. You can't I can prove it. No. I can prove <laughs> it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I you are you are officially like a zoomer congratulations <laughs> you've been you've been enlisted in the ranks of zoomer there's no time. reason to smear me like this I, mean, um, I come to the stream well, and this is how no I guess. no look it, I, it's I really, a pleasure I, of course to be in the presence of a world famous guy like settlers lament yeah that's no, all course, i have to say no, no. yeah um and i don't want to you know settlers lament you make a very compelling argument and i cede the ground to you and i will leave you with a um with a reference to a um Ecclesiastes ten thirteen, particularly section A, um, and you, you know, pride is the beginning um, of sin. <laughs> so whoa, 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 whoa. I, I, um, okay. I see. Okay, the okay you're right. You're right. You are more famous than me. You are more popular than me. I, I disingenuously hey, humble I myself before you. <laughs> hey, I, I want to be. I want to be very clear about something. <laughs> I'm not prideful at all. There's, there's no hint okay. of pride in any of this. I just really enjoy accuracy in entertainment, like accuracy in advertising, that type of stuff. And mm -hmm. I just know that, like, th this is just false to say that you're more famous than me. No, I'm okay, not like I don't say yeah. that I'm, I don't say I'm world famous to like puff up my pride. That that, that has nothing to do with it. It's a fact. And <laughs> okay, you're not you're not world famous. You know who is so, world famous? Patrick Buchanan. Who we should that, be that, talking that's, about? That's true. That's true. So, um, so David, as the resident Pat Buchanan expert, sure. is there anywhere you'd like to, uh, us to get started with on this? Um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think like in my estimation of it, there is um there's really three main pivotal moments in his career, and that was in um 1972 um, during the Watergate committee. He was he was called to testify with less than like he was subpoenaed with less than 24 hours of notice. He didn't have time to go through any of his um you know memos to the president, or you know this was in relation to Nixon. And I was listening to this um this document or the the audio recording of this today in preparation for this. And it really just amplifies what, you know, was revealed the other day on Tucker Carlson's show. And that, and that it's that, um, it was all just a witch hunt. Like these people were just mad that Richard Nixon won in the biggest election landslide in the history of the United States. And they were really, really upset about it. And we're looking for anything to take them down. And Pat Buchanan just absolutely decimates them. Um, the whole, the whole committee, um, when he leaves, when he gets up to walk away, they say, thank you, this added nothing to the record that we didn't already know. Basically admitting like, wow, this we, he just trounced, trounced us. Um, and it, it goes to show that, you know, you said at the beginning of the stream that um, Pat Buchanan is not only, you know, he's, he's a politician, a pundit, commentator, but he's an operator, uh, first and foremost. He got into politics um, writing for um, some, I think, defunct magazine now, or paper, but... What, what what really made him who he is is like the his his time with like Nixon and this is like the first book um, that he wrote about that it's it, two volumes the greatest comeback and then the White House Wars it was it was about his time with Nixon he was the second person I think that Nixon hired um, in his efforts to get back into into the presidency basically and campaigning after Nixon famously said that he's done after losing the gubernatorial race in California. Um, but I recommend that any uh, any young person who's interested in writing, getting involved in politics, or any other type of organization behind the scene that has to do with this world, um, read that book. Uh, it's incredibly important tactic, strategy, talking about kind of the type of uh, slanders you'll encounter and, and the way that people operate. Um, I, th I found it very informative, and it's it's. And then obviously, the White House Wars is the second volume, very good as well. And just very a practical guide that's enjoyable to read, and and that's the other thing about Buchanan, man, is that he's so he's he's like a he's he's a very southern conservative. You know, he grew up in Washington D.C. when it had a population of eight hundred thousand, four hundred thousand Black Americans, four hundred thousand White Americans. It was very like um, culturally homogenous, though, and he grew up with a great um, reverence for the South and for America. His uncles fought in World War II. Um, and he he really is like a Southern conservative. And, and that's something that we don't have a lot of uh, in recent American history. Uh, and I think that, you know, the way he writes, the way he speaks, it's all in very like simple sentences. He doesn't he doesn't compound. He doesn't um, do do anything fancy. And, and I think that's like the, the art of um, Buchanan. But really, OK, sorry, I'm getting I'm rambling now. But that's like the first part is like the Watergate in 1972 goes in there, trounces him. Second, like major pivotal moment that most people will remember him for is his campaigns um, in 90, 92 and then 98 and 2000. Uh, first time as a Republican and the second two times as the Reform Party ticket. Um, and obviously that led up to the RNC speech in 1992 with the culture war speech where he basically went up and like Aaron said earlier in the stream, um, gave a, you know, a precursor to what was Donald Trump. Um, and, and what was eventually the the nationalist or America first message that that came to resonate um, within the Republican Party? He was a man before his time, and, and that's and that's really why why he uh, why he's he's stuck around and he's been so so relevant because during a period of decay in in the seventies and sixties, he advocated for a revival. Um, in an era of liberalization, he advocated for uh, you know tradition. In an era of globalism, he championed nation and all of these things. And he was like the only person that really did this. There were others, um, Samuel Francis, Pat Robertson. Um, but for some reason, Pat Buchanan is probably one of the few people that has really stuck um, in the mainstream media as well, going on Fox News as recent as, I think, 2016. Um and then there was the Unpatriotic Conservatives, which was a National Review article published by David Frum, I believe, um, 
basically just like attacking anybody who was against the Iraq war, which led to the publication of TAC, um, the, the pushed up publication of the American conservative, which is a publication that's still in operation today, kind of championing conservative, paleoconservative and, and a lot of Catholic Christian conservative thought. I think those are like the, the real three pivotal moments that um, kind of display his legacy all the way from the 60s to the modern modern time um still still writing syndicated columns um well he quit on january 20th but up until this year um to thousands of readers and people really just admire him he's just a great uh great writer but i don't know if um i don't know where to go from there if you guys have any thoughts about that yeah i i i do um i mean uh aaron is there anything you'd like to say first uh, I mean, there's a whole lot there, but I mean, if, if you uh, so, sorry, have... also Aaron, much more important. We were discussing this before you came, and David probably doesn't want me to know it, what, me to say this, but I don't care. Uh, we don't really know how to pronounce your first name. I mean, your first fictional name, Aaron, Aaron, yeah. or Aaron. it is the Orin, Orin McIntyre, yeah, Orin, Orin. Um, okay, right. That, but that's yeah. what I thought, but I, I also know I normally say Aaron. <laughs> no, uh, I, I would say there, there's a whole lot of things that David just hit there, but I think the. One you could look at, like you said, uh, because it was just recently with Tucker Carlson, is the willingness to attack the deep state early on, right? Like like Carlson laying out for so many people the fact that this is just one of the early instances for people to see of a, just a deep state coup, showing that the, at the end of the day, they are the ones that control the presidency or control the the federal government not the elected representative it didn't matter if nixon had this massive blowout win in his second term uh the the deep state was still wanted to show that it had the ability to take this guy down and the fact that a guy like buchanan can go in there and just and unfortunately he was wrong about the fact that the, the deep state would not be able to uh to, to destroy this mandate but his willingness to stand in that pocket and deliver in a time when it was very unpopular you know they're all, all everything against him and and this is the case with buchanan so often right the wrong side of history the wrong side of the narrative at the end of the day everyone looking back and saying oh what a fool you were you're going to embarrass yourself but at a long enough timeline we see how vindicated he was in so many scenarios and i think uh the the watergate uh you know is is one of the like you said defining moments one of the first ones where you really see him call, calling something out and exposing something that later on uh very later on would eventually go on to be appreciated by people who are better understanding the problems that we have especially as people who would prefer to see the government actually care for this nation and not just some ideological agenda mm -hmm. yeah I, I i think one of the sort of key things that he exposed that um and that that that, that, that he understood that separates him from ma mainstream conservatives um, be, because I, I think, sorry, sorry to back up, I guess, if you're, if you're just to compare him to mainstream conservatives on some issues, um, it might not become immediately apparent, like what the big difference is. Um, I, I remember, um, even a statement from him, I think I saw, like when I was skimming his Wikipedia article, he said something that like in 2004, my, my only major disagreement is trade policy. Um, but, um, I, I think what sort of like statements like that miss is re really the main difference isn't an issue of policy per se. A ma main dif the main difference is the issue of um, an understanding of what, what situation exactly we're in. Now, I'm, I'm not saying that I don't have significant disagreements on issues of policy. I, I do. Um, and I'm sure he does too. Um, but, um, but but the, the issue is that it's not just an issue of like our society having some weird activists that are dragging us in the bad direction. Um, it's not a problem that there's just like some weird forces in our society. Um, it's that the whole civilization is controlled by hostile forces, um, that there, that this deep state is something that's hostile to traditional America. Um, it, it, it's not this, this it, it's not just one small issue. Um, it, it's really a rot that dominates the whole system. And I think that's something that he understood and pointed out. Um, and I, I think that really is one of the, uh, like principal differences between him, um, a, and mainstream conservatives. Yeah. yeah. And, and so I, I, that, that certainly is something he's been able to drag into the forefront. And I think, especially in a post lockdown world is more, much, much more obvious, um, but um, but I, I think those types of things are w w one of the most important differences he was able to show. Well, I think one of the most interesting things about that is, and I'm trying to look up the name of the speech, but Pat Buchanan was a speech writer and a special assistant to Nixon. Um, and, he, and he wrote a speech for President Agnew, or Vice President Agnew, um, who was also cooed out of office and, and puppet Ford was replaced, uh, but took, took their place. Um, 
anyways, uh, that was just basically like hammering the media. And this was in the lead up to the uh, to the election. And it really just strikes at the heart. I, I don't know the exact wording, but it strikes at the heart of the issue, which is like the elite, the media in bed together, um, pushing, uh, you know, an agenda that is harmful to the nation. And, and he, he and the way he writes, like I said, he's known for clarity and, and for good reason. Um, one of my favorite lines from his 1992 speech is like the, the, you know, the Democrats over at the masquerade ball in Manhattan, which is where their convention was held. They are trying to, um, you know, tell you to elect the president of the, you know, the, the fallen apart 60s Democrats and, and even worse 70s and the way he speaks. And, and this kind of strikes at the heart of like who he is. He's like a he's like a jolly, like just. um southern like aristocrat like the guy he reminds me of my grandfather um he reminds me of um just someone who you would see on the front porch of like a uh of a mark twain novel who's smoking on a pipe and just like laughing and and tucker carlson kind of resembles this in many ways the way his demeanor how he takes everything with a with a with a hint of irony and, and um and and smiles while talking and um but anyways, his his ability to navigate this when he even spoke at the Watergate committee, he he began with a joke. He began his R and C speech in 1992 with multiple jokes, um, even though he was looking, you know, he's, you know, hey, I just lost, you know, I just lost an election that I tried really hard to win. Um, he, he started his speeches with jokes and, and a smile on his face. And I think that that's something that we don't see a lot of. Um, the ability to, you know, precisely strike at the heart of the issues uh, facing America, the foreign policy with China and Russia and the dynamics between globalization, industrialization, Mexico, border, um, the deep state, the little American radicals, like all of these ideas that he kind of touched on in his time writing and, and being a pundit, um, but also like not being a total like nerd who is uncharismatic and um, boring to listen to. Yeah. And, and not, um, being like, I don't know, uh, being pessimistic about the future, but not being black pilled, I, I guess is a, is another way of putting it that like, you know, it doesn't look like things are going in a good direction, but not being depressed about it. Yeah. Like I, yeah. I like you know, someone, a figure that I do very much appreciate even after cer certain Twitter wars that have revolved around him recently, Peter Hitchens, um, who d does it has not been able to capture that. Who, I, as great a, as Peter Hitchens is, and I, I still do think he's great, um, he, he's just way too much of a black pillar. He's just, you know, England's dead, England's done. There's no possibility for saving it. Um, the, the, this, this, that, that, you know, the, I, I know people have said I'm a black pillar before, and I, you know, I've said that sort of ironically in the past. Um, but I, I don't think that type of attitude, if that's what I mean by the black pill, is useful. Um, and that's, yes, that's certainly not something that, d d despite the, um, uh, despite these um, dourness of a lot of his predictions, it, it's not something that really uh, entered into um, Pat Buchanan. Well, this is the other thing, though. Peter Hitchens isn't, isn't he's not religious, is he? Uh, no, he's, he's, he's a practicing mm -hmm. Anglican. Oh, is he really? Okay, good, good. Well, I, I'd say that... Um, uh, probably a major. Though, though I, I suppose being Anglican was pretty black pilling. Yeah, uh, I'm, I'm sure. I don't know what type of eschatology they subscribe to, um, but I assume that I'm being a sure Catholic, on, on millennial. I'm, 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 yeah, I'm sure that being a Catholic though, and like a very informed Catholic, and you know, deep knowledge and theology and history kind of informs Pat Buchanan's like eternal optimism although probably like the rest of us like very in the short term you know we're looking at selling you know we're selling um and then we'll buy the dip if we have the chance but i, I doubt it um so he, he kind of understood the um you know what was at stake um or he does understand what's at stake and uh, you know and he tr you know he tried his best in the in the 90s and 2000s to like course correct and um he did good work uh and he never stopped like you know what are you gonna do I and mean, that's that's basically all you can do um but the fact that he did it with a, like i said a smile and and wit and comedy without making very many enemies like people made enemies of him but he never really explicitly um you know he was never afraid to 
to shake a shake a hand based on like personal accounts and, and things that I've read of him. A lot of a lot of more recent like liberal and, and moderate conservatives coming out and like writing like my interaction with Pat Buchanan um was, you know, like this and this. You know, I, I slandered him in the past and and he, you know, saw me later on at mass and shook my hand and and um you know made peace with me, you know, as you do um during mass. Allegedly I've never really been. Um and you know that that that's that's the type of thing that builds a legacy. Um, I think if you just kind of you, you just you told either, me like a, a week or two ago that you've been to, that you went to. Mass. I said I've never really been. Okay, never really never, been. I never pay really much been attention. Me. I didn't pay much attention. Okay, okay. Um, but yes, no, that that is so true. Agree. Um, we got got a couple super chats. Um, from I have no idea how to pronounce this. I, I know I've gotten super chats from you before. Um, but w from whomever, um, it's Bolero. Uh, Bolero. Okay. I know. I, <laughs> I, I don't, I don't, I guess that's probably some sort of Mexican thing considering the profile picture. I, I don't know much about us, Spanish Mexican culture. Um, but, um, but neoconservatives love America because it's great. Uh, and it's me. It's a means to their ends. Buchanan loves America because it's his. That's right. Um, yeah. So no. Yes. So so true. This is something that, that um, you know. I don't. You know. I love AA. I don't want to start like you know, YouTube wars with AA or anything. This, this, oh, this, this isn't. Um, so so this, this isn't me trying to like you know st start any battles with uh, with academic agent or anything. But he said the other day something some, something along the lines on, on Twitter like you know why why would anyone want to save America? Um, and my my response to that was just because it's their home. And it, you know, I'm not American. I even, you know, I we're not going to get into this today, but a certain degree of anti-Americanism, properly understood, is central to Canadian conservatism. Mm -hmm. um, but, uh, 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 but, uh, I, you know, I, I, I still understand the uh, piety that any healthy person should have for their own country. Um, and it, it's unhealthy not to have that piety. It's, it's the same sort of thing as familial piety, just on a larger scale. Um, and you, you, you should always want to save your country if there's uh, problems with it. And, and I, I think this is um, w with people who are overly ideological, um, they, they, they sort of view a state as something that is that, 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 that is itself purely ideological, that the, the state doesn't exist um, as an extension of your family. The state exists because there are certain rational goals for the state. Um, basically, the Soviet Union model of a state. Um, only in a neocon state, uh, it's not for Marxist goals. It's for um, it's for like American values, quote unquote, or it's for liberalism, or it's for w w whatever. Um, but Trotsky um, had goals, but yeah, 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 yeah right, yeah. Exactly. Um, but but yeah, but yes, the, and I um, uh, that you know, there, there there's some people on, on the right that have this same sort of view. Um, that they they think of the state as just like embodying basedness, and that's that's why like you know they 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 like oh I, I want to like move to like Iran or Russia or something because those are based states and America's a cringe state. So you just want to go to the state that has more based levels. Um, now I you know I've I've uh, I've disavowed the Russia based stuff in the past. I don't need think we need to rehash that. Um, but be, beyond the truth claims, there there there's sort of the fundamental issue of. Um, of, of the, like your 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 state, it, like your your country, your nation. It's not about like what's the most base. It's not about what's the most ideologically pure. It's about what is your own. Um, and and that, yes, that that, that certainly That's right. where I I think yeah, well, Buchanan's on the right side and the neocons are on the wrong side. Well, and this is why you know Buchanan's instincts are so powerful and why he cuts through so much of this. Is this is his greatest strength? Is he is in defense of a nation, not an ideology, not a system. He's in defense of a people. He's in defense of something that's real, and that and so that means that he's often so right because he's ignoring many of the like prefabricated ideologies that get handed for containment to American conservatives. He doesn't care about your you know super libertarian economics or uh you know immigration policy because what he cares about are the people inside the united states and their well-being and so he's kind of 
you know, he's, he's working in that Carlisle f- framework. You know, it's, it's, it's the question of America. You know, mm-hmm. it's, it's not something you can put on a spreadsheet. It's not something you can figure out with GDP and a cross section of, you know, expect of life expectancy. It's something that you have to evaluate by being American and understanding America and understanding the people who live there. And because of that, he's consistently looking at, you know, foreign policy. How does it actually benefit the people who live under this government? How does, you know, immigration, how would it actually change the lives of people who are currently, you know, residing in the United States, uh, hollowing out the middle class and manufacturing? What impact is that going to have not on coastal elites, but the people who occupy, you know, Iowa and stuff like what, what does that actually look like? And the fact that, you know, he he was always caring about the nation and the people of the nation rather than fording, you know, whatever was coming out of another conservative think tank meant that he, you know, in the long term was just right far more often than he was wrong. Yeah, so so true. So true. Um, uh, so we got another super chat also from, you know, I'm not going to say his name. You know, I, 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 I don't care <laughs> how to pronounce it. I refuse to say his name. Uh, did Buchanan flinch on the MLK question, or was he just going along with the Reagan administration's decision at the time? I have no clue. Uh, can anyone else answer that? I I, I really don't know. Um, I think, like a lot of people, um, on the 50th anniversary of uh, MLK Day, I think Pat Buchanan, which was like 2017 or 2018, I think, I think Pat Buchanan put out a pretty scathing um, repudiation of you know, the life and legacy of MLK as, um, so many people should. Uh, and I, I, but during the Reagan days, you have to remember that Pat was a, was a, one of the martyrs of the Nixon era. And he was kind of sidelined during the, uh, during the Gerald Ford admin. And I think he resigned briefly after, um, Ford took over because they put him in some unimportant spot and then came around, uh, Carter and, 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 and Reagan eventually. And so he got, I think he got back involved, uh, and, you know, whatever influence he did hold was diminished. Um, everybody that was in the white house during, you know, high up at least, um, during the Watergate scandal that wasn't approved of by the regime and the operators within the regime, um, you know, they were, they were tarnished and and their influence and and ability to influence policy and and rhetoric and and the way that conserve the conservative movement thought about things greatly diminished. Um, But even beyond that, you know, when you you work at the discretion of the president, we do know, on the other hand, that his, his, uh, a friend and colleague of his, I think, uh, Samuel Francis, who at the time was a speech writer for Jesse Helms, was the, one of the main guys behind Jesse Helms is like, push in the Senate to, to make sure that MLK day did not become a national holiday. Although I, I, you know, that felt, um, so I, I think that there's like similar sentiments, um, behind that, but it's, you know, what happened versus what might've happened. Yeah. I, I think, uh, if I remember correctly, Buchanan was like the comms director for, for Reagan for a while. And so it's one of those situations where he can't just go out and like give his opinion on, on the issue he's he's kind of that's not his his job in that role but uh for anyone who is curious i I did do an episode with ryan turnip seed going through uh the history of mlk his own quotes his you know the fbi reports all all, all the stuff in his background so people can check that if you want but but i don't think buchanan would have come out directly during that time just because he that that was not his role inside the white house to be Mm -hmm. issuing his own personal opinion yeah um yeah no, exactly. I think okay, uh, I, I got a I got another very important uh, question here. Not a super chat, but uh, well, statement comment. I've done more for AV than David Carlson has. What what, what do you have to say to that, uh, David? Benny, you're fired. Uh, you're fired, Benny. Sorry, it's over for you, buddy. Uh, pack your bags. Um. Anyways, yeah, I, I just pulled up an article. Um. That syndicated as in the Greenville news. Uh, I was surprised to see Patrick Buchanan's blatantly racist column on the anniversary of the murder of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Buchanan says America's elites are, are adamant that our country should vanish inside the third world nation that resembles in its racial, religious, and ethnic composition, the UN general assembly. <laughs> um, so I, I, you know, the good, uh, the, the article says the old God and country America that people love, they detest. 
he might as well have said blood and soil. <laughs> God forbid. Um, anyways. Yeah, I guess he came out against like uh, the hood of MLK. And that's a big deal. Um, no. So, yeah, he's he's based. He's not cringe. <laughs> Uh, so yes, moving on. Um, Charles Redding for five dollars. Uh, Sir Guy Carlton is the only one who could save America. False. Jesus can save America. Oh, um, this this is classic papist nonsense. Um, no, I know. I mean, like I said, I mean, we're not going to get into the details of this. I I do think a certain degree of anti-Americanism is necessary for Canadian conservatives. Um, and I mean, I know Charles. I know he's not trying to be autistic or anything here. I know he's just making a joke. Um, but I, you know, I I, I don't uh, feel like it's uh, it, it, it's it's helpful to be like. It, w w when I say anti-American, I mean like opposing American influence in Canada. I don't. Um, I mean, you, you you could say like you know having a YouTube channel uh, where all you talk about is American politics. Um, <laughs> but um, uh, I I don't mean like autistically complaining about America on Twitter when I say anti-Americanism. Um, but, um, but yes. So, so, so David, I mean, uh, uh, is, is there anywhere else you'd like to go with this? I don't know. I, I think that, um, his, you know, his, uh, the reason he's around is because like I said earlier, he is, you know, he's a voice, he's voicing opinions that have not been allowed to be voiced. And, and he's saying things that were, were not really allowed. And, and, not many people had the guts or even the know-how to say. Um, I was listening to a speech that he gave in the Nixon Library, I believe, um, earlier today as well. And he said, he, he used the term anti-white, uh, which I was like, oh, interesting. <laughs> I was like, I didn't, you know, that's that's good. Um, you know, referring to the, sure. the... When was the speech from? Um, had to have been early 2000s, I think. Um, oh. I think, yeah, because he was also warning about 2008. It was, uh, it was right before the 2006 elections, I think. Um, so 2005, sometime then. I'm um, talking about how unpopular the war was at that point. So early on, in the two, well, mid 2000s, um, using the term anti-white, uh, just kind of took me off guard. I was like, I, I, I was not aware that anybody had really uttered that phrase. Um, and, uh, you know, it's stuff like that um, that makes someone, you know, uh, their legacy last. Um, but I don't know. Is there uh, is there anything else that you would like to get into? I mean, you are the host. After yeah, all, yeah, no, no, I, I know. Can't I know. Um, rely on your quote unquote minions for everything. <laughs> uh, yes. No, I, I just want to see where you're at. Um, I mean, so you were talking about earlier uh, the, the three stages of his life. Um uh, I mean, uh, you, you talk about how he was an operator. C could, could you expand more what you mean by that? Oh yeah, no. This is my. This is kind of the, the best. The best. Um, the best. Uh, because I, I think that it's kind of understated in the world of pundits and politics. Um, the behind the scenes guy, and this is becoming less popular, uh, or, or more popular. This idea, um, you know, the staffer is vital um the chief of staff the comms director you know obviously the james bakers the 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 funnel to the president is through the chief of staff um you know arguably the second most powerful person in the administration is the chief of staff um and so it's always fascinating to hear the accounts of people that are working behind the scenes um buchanan was there from the beginning he, uh, nixon's effort to uh, regain the momentum that he had lost after the 60s election was legitimately uh won by jfk and um then you know he subsequently lost a gubernatorial race in california where he famously said uh you guys can stop writing in articles about me and re stop reporting on um, my news conferences because this is the last one i'm holding and it was you know everybody ran like very um you know post-mortems of his political career and you know, he was he was destined. Nixon was destined to be the next president, right? Like Dwight D. Eisenhower, he was the VP. He was in charge of the party, but they were in the minority ever since like the midterms with Dwight in his um, first first uh, first admin, and his whole career as the Republican Party leader, he was a minority minority leader. The Republicans were outnumbered in the House, the Senate, um, and local elections. I mean, we got stomped i think in 64 and, and obviously with goldwater um but 
he managed to end it on top. Um, he brought it back. And that, that's the that's the purpose of like this book that was written by Buchanan called The Greatest Comeback. Uh, Buchanan met Nixon uh, and said, I want to be on your campaign if you decide to run again. They got in contact. And the book goes through how Nixon was operating with Buchanan behind the scenes and obviously multiple other players. Um, in 1966, the midterms, talking about how important they are, uh, may, you know, supporting the Republican comeback, uh, which happened in, in 66. They had a fantastic night. Uh, they barnstormed the country and Nixon's political uh, career was redeemed just like that. Um, and then obviously he went on to win in 68 and again. And the point, the point is like, he's, he's good at the punditry and the predictions and the analysis because he's lived it. He mentioned in the RNC speech in 1992, you know, I had a woman come up to me with tears in her eyes and said, I've lost my job. I have no money. They're coming to take my children. Uh, please help. You know, just like, like actual interactions with real Americans who have been going through it. Um, you know, going through the the nineties and the eighties of globalization and industrialization in, in, in Asia and and in mass immigration and all of the the problems that we're still kind of fa obviously we're still facing today and we're really seeing those consequences set in pretty solidly over the last decade or so. Um, you know, he he lived it, which is why he's so on point. Uh, and like you said earlier, he he wasn't only right about um, you know Iraq and and foreign policy and stuff like that. He was, he's, he, in 2004, he was talking about the 2008 election. Everybody thought Hillary Clinton was a shooing. He was like, no, probably not. Probably going to be some third, you know, third other unknown character. It's not going to be Al Gore. It's not going to be John Bell Edwards or not John Bell Edwards. It's not going to be Edwards. Um, you know, and, and like even the political analysis he has is spot on because he's, he's a humble guy. It appears to be. And, uh, he, you know, I really, uh, I, I really sound like a massive fanboy right now. It's it's, but you know it's all true. Um, you know, humble guy who who worked behind the scenes and learned the hard way through election challenges and political fights and scandal and hit pieces and rough and tumble world of like political campaigning in the '60s and '70s and '80s, and then he came out and he emerged as like a prolific writer and and just a, a great commentator. Yeah, no, so, so true. I mean, that that is a very good analysis. I um, I mean, I definitely agree that I think, especially in a post-Trump world, um, that uh, there there's a much stronger understanding now of the important of uh, on the importance of personnel and um, your chief of, chief of staff and stuff like that. That um, you know, it, it, I think it's very well understood now that um, that that's the type of thing that can make or break an administration. Uh, so that's all very interesting to hear about. Um, I just on what I had said recently, I, I was just skimming through my notes on um, on a suicide of a superpower. Um, and he had he had one quote that sort of more or less talked about what I was talking about in response to that super chat about neocons and Pat Buchanan. Um, and he says this in, in, close to the beginning of the book where he's um, b b basically to summarize the, the book for the audience. Um, he's he's saying that um, the. Uh, the, this, the subtitle of the book was um, was something like, will America survive to um, to like 2025 or something like that, um, which, which sounds like a shockingly close date to uh, to predict the end of America. But the uh, reason for su choosing such a close date was it was in reference to some newspaper article about the Soviet Union that said like the Soviet Union won't survive until like 1995 or something like that, which was only like seven years from when that article was written. Um, and at the time, uh, most people didn't believe would happen so quickly, but did. Um, but uh, so so in the uh, introduction to the book where he's explaining this thesis and um, how America could uh uh, how the problems in America could cause a rapid collapse, just as it did in the Soviet Union. He says, "What has this to do with us more than we might imagine? As the Soviet Union, as did to the Soviet Union, America commands an empire of allies, bases, and troops. America too is engaged in a seemingly endless war in Afghanistan. America too is an ideological nation. America too is a land of many races, tribes, cultures, creeds, and languages. America too has reached an imperial overstretch." Um, so, so just my, my my point in pointing that out um, is um, is his acknowledgement of what I was talking about earlier um, that um, that the sort of like neocon vision of America 
uh, is um, is the vision of America as an ideological state, as he specifically uh, compares uh, to like the Soviet Union, um, and that that really is the um, uh, that 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 th th this this is something I, I think there isn't even enough understanding of even among right wingers that I, I think this is really one of the biggest differences between the traditional concept of a uh, political society and the modern concept um, is this difference between a um, ideological state and a state as a family. Well, and I think it's really you have to remember that he's fighting this battle at a time we you you have this you know, two, two party system and you got to fit in one of the two and he's fighting this battle when, you know, his version of right wing conservatism is as far away from the neocon vision as the neocon vision is from progressivism. In fact, probably much farther actually. And so it's very weird because he's fighting for the heart of the conservative party against an ideology that is just radically um, opposed to kind of everything that he believes in, but is also something that he kind of has to work with because it's the frame by which almost all of the people who consider themselves conservative see the world. You know, someone who grew up as a talk radio, you know, standard issue conservative, I wouldn't have understood the issues that, that you know, Pat Buchanan was really raising. Uh, for a long time, and I think that's true of many people, and they they couldn't they couldn't grasp the the real roots of the problem he was talking about. I think until you know the 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 emotional explosion that kind of happened with Donald Trump. Donald Trump touched on so many of these issues that, of course, Buchanan had been harping on for so long, and he gave them a, a, a dynamic because he was able to to attack a media and a party apparatus that just been suppressing them forever. And even though the vast majority of people couldn't really have probably given voice to exactly what was wrong with neoconservatism, and maybe even Donald Trump couldn't properly give a voice to it, the fact that he was pushing back from it just broke. It was like an emotional dam that just broke all these people mm -hmm. who had, broke free and freed them from this kind of totalizing ideology that had contained them up to this point and i think that's why so many people look back at guys like francis like buchanan like all of these you know the, these more paleo conservatives and say okay this is something that was just completely missing you know there, there, there was this this massive gap in the conservative movement between the time of kind of this neoconservatism all the way up to donald trump and and it's not like this line of thinking didn't exist it's not that these arguments didn't exist but they had just been completely pushed and out of the movement completely marginalized completely dismissed and because of that there there had just been no way no language for the right to address the problems that it was looking at and so that's why so many people look back now and appreciate guys like Buchanan who were fighting the good fight, even when there's basically no, I mean, we, we people are like, Oh, there's no hope now. No, really for Buchanan at that time, there's really, just, he's, you know, there, there's no bridge, you know, for him to connect what he's doing to kind of what is supposed to be right wing at that time hmm. today. There's far more just because the real, the, the, the problems have become so dire that they're hard to ignore. But I think that's, again, why why so many people look at guys like him now in retrospect and say it's amazing that they were able to kind of keep that moving forward, even when there was no no real political power behind the positions that he was espousing. Right. And I think you really have to trace this back. <clears throat> Historically speaking, um, you know, Buchanan grew up in a, in a very I think he was one of like eight kids or four kids or something his his dad had like a bunch of siblings. Um but his father was a part of the America First movement, the original America First movement in um, the 40s, that were, 30s and 40s that were, were in opposition to the war, which was very common for the for the Irish and the Germans um, at that time. Um, the, the, those, you know, his family came to America in the 1600s, you know, real founding stock, and, and they kept their Catholic faith. And, you know, he would he grew up with, like, like I said earlier, reverence for the South and the Confederacy and a respect for um you know the real conservative values and and what you're saying is like there was really nothing after after Dwight Eisenhower um beat Senator Taft from Ohio who was a real member of the you know a paleo conservative um kind of figure there was really nothing that we had um maybe McCarthy um 
and another guy from Alabama um, who kind of represented some of uh, some more like hardcore ideas. Uh, but it was him, Nixon, kind of, and he messed up a bit uh, with appointees and, and policy towards China and other things. Certainly his slate isn't clean. And then Buchanan. And, and that's that's the you know, this is a very very long bridge that has few support beams underneath it. And so the, the conservative his, uh, the conservative, um, I don't know, etymology, uh, was, was lacking for, for a long time. And, and I think we've seen a resurgence of, of true conservative and, and Christian thought, um, recently. I don't know if it's going to be as effective. Um, I don't know if it's going to be able to make a difference, maybe too little too late. Um, but anyways, that's, I, I think that, um, I think that that's why what you're getting at is is so true because after Eisenhower it was just empty. It was just empty. Yeah, yeah, so so true. Um I so 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 to go back again to uh the book's a Suicide of a Superpower, um another point that I found very interesting in reading that was his analysis of um uh, of the decline of religiosity in America. Um, now, you know, in a certain sense, like th that there is a decline in religiosity, obviously, you know, that, that that's nothing unique to him commenting on. Um, and and that, that aspect of it is pretty standard. And he uh, narrates the takeover of the uh, mainline Protestant churches and the problems that have gone on with them. And all, all that type of stuff is, again, pretty, um, pretty standard. But um, but there, there's one particular thing that he talked about that I did think was very interesting is worth uh, remarking on at least briefly here. And that is the sort of consumeristic attitude that has began begun to um, to take hold of much of American Christianity. And certainly this is also true in Canada. Um, and I imagine this is true in the West in general, but at, at the very least I can say it's definitely something that seems to be true in the United States and Canada. Um, and that, 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 that is that historically in the United States, especially um, families would have very strong denominational loyalties uh, whether it's to like Presbyterians or if it's to Lutherans or um, uh, to Congregationalists or whatever, hmm. um, but to, uh, to, to today, according to surveys and um, I, I think just according to uh, if, if you speak to Christians nowadays, um, those types of denominational loyalties are much rarer. Um, it's um, it, it's much more common. Where one of the things he was talking about was how the the reason people join a church nowadays, um, a, a particular church, one church, not another, is because they're impressed with the programs they have. Or their, um, or, or they like the worship style or something like that. There isn't that sort of um, denominational loyalty that, like, my family's a Presbyterian. I believe in Presbyterian theology, so I'm going to stick with that. Um, and um, that, that definitely, I, th I think, is a very negative so social trend. Um, that one, it, 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 it relies on a certain level of um, theological subjectivism. Uh, that um, that that uh, you're you're not really uh, investigating much or caring about the specifics of the theology. Um, you're just uh, uh, looking at these sort of aesthetic uh, differences. Um, but also, it, it takes away more again from that sort of stuff I've already talked about so far. Uh, the, the sort of like family loyalty, just as you have a sort of family loyalty to the state, um, it, it's taken away from that sort of familial loyalty to the denominational tradition that you're a part of. Um, uh, and um, and I, I think that was a very interesting thing to hear to, to hear him talk about. Not something that I've really heard d directly discussed in many other places. Well, it's kind of like um, relating back to what you were talking about earlier with academic agent and, and kind of that crowd of um, some people talking about how like yeah I'm gonna move to I'm gonna move to China because it's based or whatever misguided notion people might have. Um, I remember something similar to like aesthetic based. You could call it aesthetic based politics. Like oh I think like. Chile is based because Pinochet wore a cape and it's like, well, or Franco wore a cape in Spain and, and it's like, well, okay, yeah, sure. He looked cool, but you know, what, what underlies, uh, you know, the politics, you know, what, what is the politics? And it's the same thing with that. It's like aesthetics based religion. I, I go to, I go to church because I, I like the, uh, the, the sounds that they make on the stage. I think that that's interesting. Um, you know, the, the acoustic guitar or whatever, you know, the, the churches are attracted to and the congregants are attracted to today. Um, it's just aesthetics based and there's, there's really no, no foundation in, in family faith tradition, you know, or anything biblical about it. Um, there's nothing, there's no root that ties someone down to it. And so it's, it's, it is like theological consumerism. Yes. So true. Um, 
so yeah, so I'm, I'm just skimming through my notes again. Is there any other subjects you'd like to discuss? No. Um, okay, then. Uh, well, well uh, while I skim through this, Aaron, do you have anything to say? No, I think we hit everything. Like I said, the, the you know main thing about Buchanan really funny when when people you know the, the, one of the reasons I, I tweeted about him recently was there was someone kind of screeching about him. You know, oh, finally his reign of terror is over. <laughs> blah 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 blah. And kind of the funny thing about Buchanan's enemies is like they they can like smear him right, like they can throw all the all the buzzwords around. Uh, you know, hateful, racist, whatever, blah blah blah. They, they they can make up all the you know all all the same uh, uh, lies and slander they always do, but there's they can't really ever call him wrong because like everything mm -hmm. he said came true right <laughs> like 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 obviously it's not a perfect batting batting average but it's really good right? like he he consistently just predicted the future like however you feel about mass immigration he correctly predicted its influence its coming and and what it would do to the country no matter how you feel about the uh you know the hollowing out of middle america and the destruction of the manufacturing base he was exactly right about its consequences no matter how you feel about the lack of religiosity or or, or foreign policy just time and time again he correctly predicted the future and so when these people are writing these postmortems on him and saying oh well you you know he, his career is finally done and it's so good because he was just the worst person ever they can never say like and because he was just wrong about these things like because he wasn't like he just landed th these things over and over again they can say well he should have been celebrating you know <laughs> they should have been celebrating these things right but uh but they can never say that he was incorrect in his prediction about these things because he just he nailed it over and over again and so the only thing left to say is just we don't like what he said not that he was wrong about about the the substance of what he said I don't know if right that, from the yeah, yes. yeah. <laughs> yes. um, call he, he called a shot there like, yeah, like he, Babe Ruth yeah yes um, no de 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 definitely very uh very good analysis no th th this is of course something we're very uh, we're very familiar with the the left at this stage of the um uh, of the it's not happening and it's a good thing if it yeah. is happening they they say this on everything they they say this yeah. with like uh, with illegal immigration they they say this with like trans kids they, they there, there's nothing really um that they don't say this for um so, but yes it, it's something that they 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 said with him first like with many of these things um, yeah, Pat Buchanan, just the just the original, the OG uh, celebration parallax guy. Just, yes, you know, yeah. <laughs> like like he's he's not wrong, but he should he should be celebrating these things instead of warning against them. Yeah, it's um, it, you know, he called out like the gay agenda that Bill Clinton and Al Gore were pushing, like the most progressive um, Democrats since FDR, uh, and like actually, um, and well, LBJ, I guess I should say LBJ. My bad. Um, and then you have them going on stage and being like, no, we're, you know, we're pro traditional marriage. And it's, well, we're not like pro gay, but if we were, it's a good thing that we are. It's exactly what happened. Cause they had someone at the um, convention, the DNC give a speech talking about how pro gay they are. They've been playing. It's the same playbook. They've been running the same plays. Pat Buchanan was wise to it. Maybe some other people were wise to it, but they didn't have the elegance or the clarity or the, the, charm to convey the message in a way that is long, as long lasting and as effective as uh, Patrick Buchanan. Yeah. And, and also, I mean, you know, the thing about the dishonesty of the left on this point is they aren't even really, in my experience, willing to acknowledge that these people were right. Um, they, um, they, well, they, they don't they, believe they, they, they can't, they can't, they can't. Cause if, well, no, no, it's not even like, it's not that they're not willing to acknowledge they're right on a moral level. They're not even willing to acknowledge that they're factually right. That, um, that like the, that the, these were Trojan horses or whatever. Um, they, well, um, uh, they, 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 they say, oh, you know, these people, they're just like racist. They're just bad. They're evil. Um, and they, they don't want to even acknowledge that. Oh yeah. You know, their predictions are right. It's just their predictions. Were, the, the, the result was a good thing. Well, you kind of um, see this with like the the Vince Dow clip that's been going around of um my my buddy. Now, uh, he you know he he lays out the facts about crime and assimilation, and they just kind of get offended. And it's like, well, they can't admit the facts. And it, well, yeah, of course they can't admit the facts because when you when you operate on a level that they operate on, it's you know facts are you know subject of of morals like that's 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 where it all comes down to because they have nothing like transcendent beyond 
um, what the real life is. And, and, and if it doesn't shape to their, to their pre-existing notion, then they have to lie about the facts. And, and if they admit that the fact, if they admit that Pat Buchanan was right about immigration in 1992, then they have to admit that Pat Buchanan is still right about immigration in 2002. Um, like, and then everything that they've been building for the last 70 years kind of just falls in on itself. And, um, yeah, they, they can't see it any ground. And the right wing should learn from that, too, and, and should start operating by the same playbook. You know, maybe maybe admit behind the scenes like Tony Blair does occasionally. Like, oh, maybe we were wrong about this and this and should try to reverse course. But, like, keep the rhetoric the same because it's effective messaging. You know, that type of that type of behavior. Yes, yes, totally. Um, so j j just another thing I saw in my notes. W w one thing that... Um, that I do think he actually uh, was probably in error about. Uh, so, so super, suicide of a superpower. To, to again explain to the audience, I think it was published in. Um, uh, it was published before the uh, 2012 election, and that's that's what immediately was reacting to. And I, I still think it's a very good book and something that I would recommend reading. Um, but, um, but it wasn't, um, or that, that 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 it's not something that's just um, just a product of its time. Generally speaking, the stuff that it talks about is still very um, very interesting and very useful. Um, but the um, uh, but so 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 that, that that's when it's from. And he was talking about a lot in there of the uh, difference between elite and popular opinion. Um, on certain things, um, and he was talking about how this is going to cause an increasing divide between elite and popular opinion. In one sense, that you know that, that that's clearly true, where the the elites continue to try and ram through stuff like trans kids. That's overwhelmingly um, popular. Um, but on the other hand, the, you know the examples he was talking about um, were things where I, I think he assumed uh, it, it seemed to me that he assumed that um, the public wouldn't give in on these issues, and in particular, the the issue of marriage was one of the main ones. Um, and um, and he, he he seemed to assume that like the the public would continue to reject this as the courts would force this on us and that, that you know that that's something that unfortunately we know now um, is just not the case and there, there's many issues where yeah on, on the like newest culture war issues stuff like trans kids um, the public yet hasn't and I I think hopefully an issue like that is so extreme that the public never will give in on that um, but I I don't think he um, even at a late stage like that he seemed to not entirely. Um, understand just how easily the public could be browbeaten into a f accepting these radical left wing um, issues. Yeah, the the inability of people to grasp just how malleable the public is 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 unfortunate. I mean, you can't blame Buchanan at the time. It seemed like a perfectly reasonable argument. Yeah. Um, no, I'm know. sure I've made much stupider. Uh, <laughs> I'm sure I've made much right. much bigger false predictions yeah. in my past couple. Yeah, of years. I mean, trying to attack him. It, it's no, I mean, I know you're not. I'm just saying like for for, you know, in hindsight, it's easy for us to look at that. But I mean, to this day, you know, uh, the right is still standing around being like, well, that natural snapback's going to come, baby. The pendulum's going to swing and the left's going to pay that price. You know, we still have to deal with this today. Like there's just there's just not a grasp of kind of how far you are away from just having a base level understanding of like what, what the good is and mm -hmm. how you could organize around it. So, uh, so, so it's very understandable that, that he could make that mistake. And, and yeah, I hope you're right. I hope that, uh, you know, the mutilation of children is a, is a bridge too far. Um, I'm, I'm not hopeful given the track record, but, but I hope you're yeah, right. I, I, I mean, you know, f fortunately, at least in the United States, the abortion issue is something that, um, uh, that has, you know, uh, opposition to has continued to be popular. So, I, so I hope trans kids is one issue that uh, the the same will remain true. But I, I don't know. Yeah, and and you you bring up a bridge. You mentioned a bridge too far, uh, which is something we haven't talked on. Um, which is like his his, you know, Churchill, Hitler, and the unnecessary war, and his his view of World War Two, which I think um, is rather interesting. I've been listening to the book. Um, in, in prep for this, I'm, I'm wondering if you guys are at all familiar with it and his kind of thesis. Yeah, I mean, I um, I've read like reviews on it and stuff like that, but I've never read any of the book itself, so I, I can't really comment in depth. Um, I know Peter Hitchens wrote a similar book too, but I haven't read either of those. Yeah, I started the audio book, but I had a, a bunch of things, and I, I think I only made it like a, a third of the way through, so I'm not I'm somewhat familiar with the argument, but I'm, I'm not totally. Yeah, I, I have seven hours left of the book and I don't really so I don't want to speak too much to it. Um, but my my basic understanding is that he says like, hey, the United Kingdom got involved with Germany because in World War One, 
because they were just basically trying to protect their fleet and their naval supremacy. And they shouldn't have done that. And they should have fought like a cold war with Germany and then peace would have happened. And, and, you know, basically, so, and you go, you were talking about like, he understands the, the, the baseline good, um, or people have to understand the baseline good of how to order a society. And I think that's also true with our view of history, understanding like the baseline of where everything kind of, well, not everything, but where things really went haywire and the ideas that have come out of these these very um, dark eras like World War One and World War Two, and and uh, the 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 intellectual like pushback to the the I don't know right wing authoritarianism um, across Europe and Latin America and, and other places. And I think I think Patrick Buchanan is somebody who understood uh, had had a very clear and unpopular understanding of you know what happened in world war one and world war two basically viewing it as a as a european civilizational civil war and really um maybe the maybe the climax of western civilization or christendom or whatever you want to call it obviously pat buchanan was like a realist um kind of he wasn't a non-interventionist he was a protectionist um but he, he you know he mearsheimer type of politics i think um foreign policy so it's just uh, another thing that I think we should we should probably like circle back around on a later stream and, and talk about that book in its entirety. Sadler uh, when when I've finished it and talked about it because yeah, I no, think there's I, I mean, interesting that, stuff there. Yeah, no, I mean that that definitely sounds very interesting. I, I'd be happy to do another stream on it in the future. Um, I I just like I said I haven't read it. I um uh so, so yeah I I know I, I can't really speak on um uh I can't can't really speak on too much depth to something that I haven't really read. All right. Um, so yeah, so uh, Aaron has told me that, or, or Aaron, sorry, has told me that uh, you, you have to be gone soon. Do, do you have any final words? Um, no, I think we hit everything. Like I said, uh, just you know, um, am amazing how often Pat Buchanan was right. Uh, sad and tragic how uh, little he was listened to mm. uh, in, in critical points of uh, of kind of the conservative movement. Um, but, but it is good to see, uh, that with the, you know, with the Trump, uh, movement and, and the MAGA movement, you do see people reaching back to, to appreciate, uh, how, how correct he was. And, uh, and hopefully, uh, this time around, uh, even if it might be a little too late, uh, the, the right might actually learn a lesson. The conservatives might learn a lesson about, uh, about kind of, uh, why P Pat Buchanan was correct and, and, and make a course correction that can, can lead them to, to more meaningful change and, uh, and real opposition against a regime that just does not care about the people of the country. Yeah, no, so true. Uh, th th thank you very much for joining us. Um, I mean, you can chill if you want. I don't know if that really matters since you're much bigger than me, but, uh, <laughs> you know, go, go ahead if there's anything you want to promote. Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, if you know, Orrin McIntyre podcast, the uh, YouTube channel, Twitter, all, all the Substack, all those things, just uh, blaze.com, also. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> are they making uh, old yeah. blaze? Are, 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 they, are they the ones forcing you to make the, the YouTube short? They are not. Don't don't worry. I came up <laughs> on that on my own. There was, a, I did not get a, a directive of it's time to turn out YouTube. It's time shorts. to, it's time to start making TikToks. Um, no, I, I just, uh, you yeah, know, no, it's one of those things where it's like, I, I you know, I, I've got the tweets, they're short, I figure, yeah. you know, uh, get another way to use that uh, to, to kind of get that well, message out. Well, I've been telling mutual friends of ours, I was like, get involved, like, American Virtue has gotten 7 million views in the past seven days on shorts. It's like, incredible. And I'm um, like, you guys have got to start doing this. And, you know, nobody's listening. And then I see you're, you're doing it. I'm like, He's, he gets it. You understand. So it's a, it's a good, it's a good idea. Um, yeah, I know. I, I, I was talking with this, with David behind the scenes before this, I, I really just hate the format of shorts. I, um, I mean, it is, you know, as, as you said, um, it's not really any different than tweets. Um, and I, I don't really like the format of tweets either. Um, I really like Twitter. I probably shouldn't use it. Um, and yeah, I, I, um, I, I I just I, I think it's something that you know the medium is the message. I think the medium itself is bad. It's just one of these like uh, uh, attention span sapping things. I I know this is true about um, all of social media. This is true about YouTube. This is true about what I'm doing right now. But I think it's especially true about this like TikTok shorts type stuff. And that's why I've never really wanted to get involved with it. Um, I know I I will consider trying doing it. You know I, I can always clip these streams um, for interesting things. Um, but, uh, you know, I, or I, I can also just, you know, steal clips from, uh, from the Michael Knowles show like you do. 
um, you know, there's 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 lots of things, but I, I'm really not, you know, I'm not sure if it's a format I want to get involved with. Your principled opposition is is an understandable one. I, I, I wouldn't absolutely. Uh, yeah, I would. I would not. Yeah, no, I, I mean, uh, of course, of anyone. course. To be clear, I'm not. I'm not going to counter signal anyone for doing it. Yeah. Um, but uh, I, you know, I'm not. Well, sure what do you mean? You've been counter signaling me all week for doing it. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. You, you, yeah. Anyone else? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> anyway, David, you're just jealous. I'm joking. Um, yeah. No. Yeah. No. I mean, I, I mean, Aaron McIntyre is far too important. Ar- Ar- Arun McIntyre is far too important. <laughs> Macaroon tire. <laughs> for, 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 for me to counter signal. <laughs> <sighs> One day I'll be there. That's when I know I've made it is when Settlers Lament stops like being mean to me online. It's like, yeah, I've, I'm here. Well, okay, I'm okay. successful now. One, it's one thing to uh, to acknowledge that you're more famous. It's a whole nother thing for me to stop being mean to you. <laughs> well, based on the way, based on your value judgment, like as soon as I'm more famous than you, you're going to decide to stop being mean because then you're like, oh, please <laughs> have your fans give me donos. <laughs> no, um, I, I think, yeah, I think that's, I mean, this is a good stopping point. Um, if you agree, I you should check out American Virtue. I think the link is in the description, and that's basically all I have going on. So, uh, yeah, no, I'm 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 happy to stop here. Um, uh, so so yeah, yeah, I I, I mean I, I don't really have anything um anything in particular to close with. So thank you everyone very much for joining us. Uh, you know, subscribe to both these guys. Um, and I mean Pat Buchanan's very old, so please pray for him. Uh, that that uh, you know that w- when his time comes, he will have a good death, um, uh, and um, and that he'll go to meet our Lord. Uh, th- thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. Uh, pray for David and a- a- Aaron's conversion to the one holy Catholic and apostolic church, outside of which there is no salvation. Uh, thank you for joining us. God save the King. <laughs>